So, a very good day to one and all. I am Dr. V. Rohit Gopinath and today we will be talking about a very important pediatric surgical topic, intersusception. So, any pediatric surgical topic would be incomplete without a detailing of the history behind the pathology and the evolution of the management uh, techniques. So, you find that the first hunter was the first person to describe this condition called intersusception and Greg was a very important personality who was said to have reduced an intersusception using these instruments here called hand bellows, which were generally used in chimneys. Wilson proposed and, pro and performed the first laparotomy and manual reduction of a case of intersusception in an adult. Hutchinson did the same in a child as well. Hirschsprung, the term Hirschsprung keeps coming up, propping up again and again as well as pediatric surgery is concerned. He proposed hydrostatic reduction as a methodology in the management of intersusception. Fioretto et al. proposed pneumatic reduction as a modality of management of intersusception. So, after the history, now we will get into that intersusception topic as such. So, intersusception, like many other medical terminologies, comes from the Latin term intus and susipiere. Intus means within and susipiere means to receive. So, definition of an intersusception is basically an invagination of one loop of bubble into another. It can be anti-grade or it can be retrograde, depending upon the underlying pathology. Any intersusception has two very important components. One is intersusceptum, another one is intersuscipience. So, intersusceptum is the bubble which is invaginating into the adjacent bubble. So, this component here is the intersusceptum and intersuscipience is the one which is receiving this invaginated bubble. Basically, it is a recipient. So, intersuscipience. So, this is the intersuscipient and this will be the intersuscipium. It is said to be the second most common for acute abdominal pain in children, especially infants, the first one being constipation. There are few illnesses in which the clinical history and physical examining findings are more suggestive of the correct diagnosis than intersusception. So, these are not my words. These were the words of this great personality here who was a great doyen in the field of pediatric surgery, Dr. Robert Gross. So, it is very common among infants. In fact, you find that it is by incidence is about 1 to 4 in 2000 infants with a very proposed, with a proposed male predominance. And the incidence of intersusception seems to be highest less than 2 years with 75% cases occurring in children less than 2 years of age. And children less than 3 years, 90% of cases occur in children less than 3 years. And 40% of cases occur in children between 3 to 9 months of age. Indicating that 3 to 9 months seems to be a very important period as far as intersusception is concerned because it seems to occur very commonly within that age group. So, Intersusception need not occur postnatally, it can even occur, need not always occur postnatally, it can occur even perinatally or prenatally or antenatally as it is called, in which case it is called an in utero intersusception. An in utero intersusception is a vascular accident to the bubble because the bubble tends to lose its vascularity resulting in the formation of what are known as atresias, small bubble atresias. Now, the incidence of intersusception seems to be there among siblings, but you find that this connection between intersusception and siblings is more related to viral infections which seems to be common, uh, which seems to predispose to intersusception rather than a genetic predisposition to this condition. So, and you find that this viral, the connection between viruses and intersusception is more been supported to a very large extent by the fact that intersusception seems to have a seasonal predominance seems to be very common during the months of May, June and July. So, what is the pathophysiology behind intersusception? So, in intersusception, so we have two loops of bubble here and one loop goes into the other. So, the bubble which goes into the other loop tends to carry with it the mesentery as well. So, as the mesentery enters inside, there is traction on the mesentery. When there is traction on the mesentery and the bubble enters in along with the mesentery, you find that first the lymphatics get obstructed, following which there is venous occlusion. Once there is venous occlusion, you find that 
there'll be edema settling and venous congestion occurring. So venous congestion and edema produ produces increased mucus secretion and bleeding into the bowel, producing the classical red currant jelly stools. Over a period of time, as the venous congestion increases, the pressure mounts and subsequently the arterial supply gets compromised, resulting in gangrene of that particular bowel loop. It is to be noted that the first layer to undergo gangrene in an intersusception is the outermost layer of the bowel containing the intersusceptum. A bowel contain outermost layer of the bowel containing the intersusceptum, whereas the inner layer of the intersusceptum very rarely undergoes. Very uh, in inner layer of the intersusceptum does not usually undergo early gangrene. The outer layer of the intersusceptum or this area here usually does not undergo gangrene. 